Hello everyone and welcome back to another Second Life's Travels video and we are at another project done by Brino. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And we are at Virginia Alone. Virginia Alone is uh... well I'm gonna just go ahead and let the sign explain it if I can get a good shot of it all in a little bit of space that I have. Okay, there we go. Virginia Blakely is an 80-year-old, nearly blind lady who lived alone for 20 years in the house that I have reconstructed. She is someone who suffers from schizophrenia from without recognizing that it is her illness. With psychologists and textbooks to endlessly classify behaviors and symptoms, but this story is not about that. It tells of a lady who struggled her entire life against a mystery which she classified and came to grips with under her own interpretations and personal fortitudes and, yeah... Sorry about that. Virginia recorded her thoughts on hundreds of cassette tapes over many years. I've used portions of the East to give a glimpse into her mind. Some also contain segments of an interview I did with her at a nursing home when she was brought after being discovered by her estranged daughter in the derelict house. By clicking on any tapes or cassette players in the artwork, you'll be taken to a YouTube site to hear a portion of a cassette. You'll find them difficult to comprehend, but the more tapes you listen to, the greater will be your understanding of Virginia. This build opens June 22nd at the Santa Fe New Media Festival, and I would like to express my appreciation to the organizers for their interest. Virginia alone will run three weeks on a 10-foot monitor connecting this virtual environment to the real-life exhib exhibit. Well, I'm a little late for that. <laughs> it's uh, August now. So we're just going to run through this the regular way. And, um... Yeah... So, what this is going to be about is that we're going to go through a house and we're going to listen to cassette tapes of this woman that lived there, and this is a lot, I, I've already been in there and listened to one tape, and uh, I would say this is very different from Anna's Many Murders, and because of that I'm pretty much, once I get up to the house I'm going to cut off my recording and this is going to pretty much be just record the cassette tapes playing as I don't really want to have my voice over this and I see somebody else over there oh, look at these birds that's pretty neat is that an actual person or is that a statue? oh that's Breno themselves Oh. I was not expecting that. I guess the creator's just hanging out. That's a pretty low telephone line there. Now, I can't say this is for everyone, but I I found the cas the cassette recording that I listened to to actually be pretty interesting, so Hopefully you will too. And we are at the house. Yeah. Is that a clothesline, I guess? Now I'm just getting distracted. And we shall now begin the story of Virginia. And here she is herself. Today is Wednesday, July 21st, 2009, the anniversary, first anniversary of the day the house disappeared. It has created circumstances that keep me housebound, and when I do go outside a few feet from the front door, I must now take a radio, set it on the ground, tuned into a fairly loud noise to orient myself back to the house in the proper direction. July the 21st, 2008, I went outside around 10 feet and back into the house. Things were okay. But it was then necessary to take out a rinse pail. pail. When I went to go back that time, that second time, 
I soon discovered there was no front step. Then there was no porch. There was no side of the house. And when I eventually got around to the back door, there was no step, there was no door, there was no house there. Now I am a senior, 79 years old, and have extremely poor eyesight. I could see no more than a foot ahead of me. And the whole place is covered with a heavy white fog and has been for several years. After a few hours, I had to acknowledge that the house was no longer there. I had nowhere to go but outside. I was propelled around the yard, holding one of the pails in my left hand. I had no thought of where I was going, except I would keep trying to get into the house. And I ended up going out to the front ditch. There was little traffic and no one paid the slightest attention to me. And I hadn't yet realized the only really thing I should do, real thing I should do, was holler, which I didn't do for a while. After ending up on my knees at times and seeing that the flowers in the front ditch had been gouged out so someone had come along with a machine when I didn't hear it, spending nine, about nine and a half hours outside in the hot summer sun with nothing to eat or drink. Only then did I sit down, sit down to rest permanently where the front steps used to be. Immediately I felt myself to be out at the front ditch where I had not been before in an entirely different spot. I was there a short time and I apparently was waving my arms and hollered. When one car hesitated then went on and the next one stopped. It was my next door neighbor whom I didn't recognize for a while and I asked would he please walk me back to the house which he did. And when we got there, he was surprised to see the clothesline, which I told him I couldn't find. And he says, there, should there are pallets and your door. I was able to go in. The house was back. <laughs> A clear, understandable explanation of this I have yet to find anywhere in my mind or any other hint I can find. My relatives are kind, but I think they thought I was wandering. In a sense, I was, but not the way they meant. One side of me was in one world, and the other side of me was in another one. And they can also check Google Earth, or Earth Google, whatever it is. I cannot get anyone to do so. The necessary information is Ontario, Canada, Lambton County, Don Euphemia Township, 9th Concession, Lot 17. This is now known as 653 Gould Road. There is much to be thankful for among the information I have gleaned from this horrible experience, which it was, more so after the fact, when I got to thinking about it. I'd get all my pails and things out on the porch, so. and then put the radio by the, in good weather, I put it out just off the edge of the step so I knew where it was by touch. Otherwise it had to sit up on the top of the porch where it would make a noise out front and uh, and I would turn it on and usually it stayed on okay there was interference now and then though I had a long window and 
I would take the pails out and empty them. And I never went very far from the front because I never felt, excuse me, never felt safe enough. The radio could quit sometime. I told BJ if, if I ever disappeared to take everybody out with a bunch of radios and look for me. <laughs> But I do feel somebody could disappear someday after seeing the house was gone. I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if it was sort of superimposed either way down the road. And because I couldn't see it, I didn't know it. That it was over in the field, and the field was over where the house should be, something like that. Because all around where the house should have been were um, bean plants with the leaves pretty much off. And that would be the edge of a field. That's the only explanation I can have, but why it changed, I'm not too sure. No cats, no house. Uh, oh, no, I was out to the front, accidentally, and some of the front iris and peonies and stuff. That was all dug out. I don't know where it was, but it was gone. As if somebody come along with a tractor and plowed it all up or something. The garden itself was still there. And there was something, somebody had plowed across the driveway as though trying to keep traffic out, something like that. But to spend a whole day with nothing being where it should be was really upsetting and yet I knew that these things were happening so it would straighten itself out and it did um, you want me to hook? In general, I am pretty well, but I have weak spells. Probably because I'm not eating properly, and every once in a while I don't have quite enough. But we manage. Half the time I open the wrong can, and that's wasteful. And the cats will eat almost anything except beets and green beans. <laughs> But they're very good at cleaning up what I don't happen to be able to eat at the moment. My eyesight is not much better. It fluctuates a bit, but it's not really good. What bothers me is my orientation, and I suppose that is linked with the left-right business. And if I am not really careful, there are days when I cannot stand to bend and twist and carry without expecting to bring up eventually. Now, it's not a great big upheaval. It's the last time I was outside and had to sit on the edge of the step. It's just a gentle business. Eventually, one Friday night, when I suppose Everybody was so supposed to be home waiting for supper. A car drove in, which I didn't realize, and someone went to the back door, which I still didn't realize, just as they had when the two cats were put in a couple of years ago. And I did not hear a thing. I did hear a sort of a whoosh, which I realize now was somebody taking the foam pad out of the door. But I did not hear it when they opened the door. The propane man had left the door beautifully shut, and I thought, well, I'll leave it. I won't have to worry about it. But I've been glad of the extra ventilation. No. Shortly after, I suppose, this vehicle drove out, and I heard it. And I thought, oh, that's that person. And I had a voice beside me saying, I'm that person out there, yak, 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 all sorts of stupid stuff, which I said I didn't believe. And it was all so spooky with this voice beside me here. 
so what is the person supposed to believe when they've got a, a fairly normal world and a world that goes quite cuckoo from time to time? It's this left hand, left side that wants to take over. I don't know what to do about this except to refrain from using my left, which is pretty much okay, but it, I get physical problems, and it does not make sense. I've never known anybody to have this problem before. How can I have one side that's fighting the other all the time? But that's what it is, I think. And I'm fighting them both. <laughs> I have to consider very carefully everything I do and especially everything new I think of doing. Things I might do I don't dare touch because I know what will result. I am panned in here by this stupid left side that is determined it's going to run things and I'm determined it's not. And that's all I know about the situation. And um, my older sister went to live with her grandparents in Dresden. But she was killed about two years later on the highway going to school. A tractor came along pulling a threshing machine and the kids took turns jumping over the pole bar, whatever you call it. And I guess she didn't make it. Well, I learned to clean a chicken. That's one thing I did learn. I I could take the chicken from feathers to oven. No, no, we did the did the feathers. Wait now, we must have done something like that, but I don't remember that step. If we wanted the feathers for pillows, we didn't do that. My aunt said when she was younger, they used to. And her mother-in-law, I guess it was. They used to go out every season and catch the geese and pluck the feathers. And she said, one day we were so tired, we just went in and told her we couldn't catch them. <laughs> I should tell you about the pig in the well. The water well was cleared out. You know where they... Maybe you don't. It's all bricked in and then covered over. That's the well in the country. Uh, they took the lid off one day and for some reason or other they had a huge big school bell out in the garage so they put it up in the barn and then the men went way back about as far as they could go in the field to work. And they said, now ring the bell if anything bad happens. Well, they no sooner got back there than up from the barn, crossing the bridge over the creek and up to the house, came a pig. Not very big. I'd never seen the pig before, but amble, 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 and plop down into this open space. Now, I think pigs must sense water. There would be a pipe out to the barn underground. I don't know. Anyway, it rang the bell, and I went out in the Lane went and flopped my arms to show them it wasn't me down that well. They came up and the hired man got a ladder and went down, got the pig and took it back to the barn. But that was one of the funny, funnier things that happened. You should know somebody who could tell you if pigs follow water system. I think pigs are, what do you call those sticks you have? Dowsers. But I was glad it wasn't me down there. For once I wasn't dumb enough to do that. It wasn't very far down, six, seven, eight feet. I go where the chair goes. There's Rena going again. She really took off this last week. Well, she's much more melodious than that and strong. Be before the full moon, she was very bad. She, well, you've been hearing her probably. It, it's um, she's been doing it ever since I've been here, and the crazy part is I recognized her. 
I heard you on one before, but I can't figure out where. Unless my aunt and I came to visit somebody a long time ago when Rena was here, where she was. This one was your lunch There is a rough drawing of what I believe the cat, strange cat that was here looked like. And I believe this was the cat that the other cats ate. Now this drawing is in a magazine or a catalog in the hamper that Anne bought me where all the accounts and odds and ends like that are kept. I told PJ, who noted the cat being eaten when she came with the groceries one day, that I believed it was an animal mutilation. She didn't say a thing. I don't know if she repeated this to anyone or not. I have been aware of animal mutilations in general since they were reported years ago, but not this specific third and half cat business. In the information given to uh, IANDS and Ann and Doug and Ken and Phyllis Wilson over at Asparagus Farm, I report the animal mutilation of a cat here. All she lost, though, was her leg. There was no blood or where I could have tramped on her if I hadn't been careful. She was dead, of course. If I went to Victoria Avenue Church and played the piano for three or four hours, which they let me do three or four times, because I used to go there as a kid, for two or three hours, everything would be fine. I think it was the using of the hands. Everything would be fine, and then little by little it would seep in. I'd hear a, somebody half a mile away bark, or a dog bark or something. And at night it would get worse. It was like another world closing in unless I played the piano. And I was in an apartment without a piano. I didn't get one till I moved back to the country. But that more or less saved my sanity in the city. Cassette one, side one, my own compositions, begun May 26, 2008. Composition number one, begun approximately 3.15 to 3.45 p.m. May 26.
to be finished. June the 8th, 2007. This piece is one I simply forgot to record. It's called Grand Exit from the Ark, Animals Only. And it was written either on the Lindsay Road or here on Gould Road. The first few notes are slow to represent the male elephant coming out first. This bit of music is repeated later at a faster speed to represent the female elephant bringing up the rear, coming out. In between, you can tell where there are two, two kangaroos jumping. There is also a lion in the beginning with his eyes rolled upward looking at a duck sitting on his head and the female lion beside him is sort of smiling. Then there are tons of birds and all sorts of other animals, anything you can think of. A really happy scene and noisy I expect. There will probably be some even serious errors in this note as I go along. We're having a rather noisy storm. You may hear some thunder. Tuesday, December 15, 2009. I had wore my sunglasses part of the day and tied my right shoe too tight, tightly. And when I took my shoes off for bed, I sneezed 23 or 27 times. Nose promptly began to run and ran all day, for a couple of days anyway. It turned into a good old-fashioned one-sided cold with no fever, certainly no swine flu. Runny nose, no aches or pains even. A couple of new cats, I think, little ones in yesterday and refused to go out, but they did eventually to get something to eat. Anne called. She's not impressed about the tie and the shoe business, but I'd like to see her do a half a day with a too tight shoe and not get away with it. Not end up with something. 
Thursday, December 17, 2008. No radio yesterday after 10 a.m. Had a marvelous sleep in the evening. Woke up at 12 o'clock, midnight. I had some cassette music, a couple of hot dogs, and went to bed. Still in the kitchen chair. Mainly because of that box, I think, that fell down and was sort of in the way to go to bed. In tonight's program, it was reminded by somebody, Richard Hoagland or somebody, that the alien corpses disappeared quite rapidly. They did not disintegrate, they did not they did not go bad, nothing like that. They simply disappeared fast, like the jars of cheese. Now you see them, now you don't. They don't go swoosh, they don't go bump, they don't go anything. They simply cease to be seen. feel a bit more settled this morning, plus I'm starting again to use the first two fingers of my right hand on my coffee mug instead of the first one. The first one is just too much, I think. County of Lambton Social Housing Services. 519-344-2057. Extension 2041. Lola, <laughs> Mama. That's a different name. <laughs> uh, crazy cat still in the house won't go out. I finally turned off that switch which turns on my left, which I had to have on all winter. I'm going to see if I can't do without it now. March account paid. Rent. 500, propane 200, hydro 50, post office 55, 5513, Mr. Lane 50, groceries 226, 96, the NSF check. Total eleven ninety five approximately. Bank balance last month eleven forty four and thirty three cents. John Liu, the magician. Every type of 
wash day problem. It tells you exactly how much soap to use, how to overcome hard water problem, how to use and care for your automatic washing machine. And now this White King wash book is yours as a gift from John Do the Magician in exchange for one White King soap box top mailed to John Do, Los Angeles 21. simply holds you in place on one side where you're not used to being and I guess that makes a difference but it tended to prove to me that I was not a normal one person that there were two things being dealt with and I think it's just genealogy but I think it was just genetics and we just haven't gone into that that much People who understand stuff, they shouldn't talk about it. It's not going to do them any good and nobody will believe them anyway. And it can do them harm. So I try not to tell anything, well, anything even from the past much. Except the other day, I, the day of the full moon, I kept seeing somebody dressed in red, really in red. Uh, coverall, sort of. Not the whole business, just a, a red coverall sort of thing along the side. No head, no hands, no nothing. Well, there wasn't any in his. But nobody owned up to wearing red. No, I don't like red. No, no, I'm not wearing red. <laughs> but that was unusual. Usually I don't see things so brilliantly colored. Except perhaps the, the day or the night that Kess was born, there was, I was seeing visions and there was a bunch of little kids, about two and three, all wearing peach hat over, little overcoats. Well, anyway, all these little kids gathered around and they would go right through my knees and my hands and I would go right through them. But they wouldn't leave me alone, and finally, to get rid of them, I had to go and lie down flat on my bone pad floor bed, and the minute I relaxed, they relaxed and went away. But I had to stop in order to stop them. And looking out the back door once, I could see a bunch of people. They were young people from almost every family on my mother's side. There was something about the place and what I saw at the back door was not what was real. Now we're getting into your virtual world. There was an old tree I'd never seen before and an old small building I'd never seen before. The barn was gone. Not even the old barn was there. There was an old wooden barn there when I first went and they got rid of it before they put the new one up and they had to burn it one day. That was interesting. The flames and stuff went straight up. There was no danger. But as I say, the backyard was not the backyard I knew. And that could be your virtual intrusion if that's what happens in the world more virtual than you'll ever know by looking at a screen. It's an uncanny feeling. And I never told my landlord. I got to the point where I quit telling him things. He was very good. He was the world's best landlord, I think. Because he didn't know what he was getting into, and I didn't either. <laughs> so we made a good pair. But as I say, if I'd been smarter, but I would never was a smart person. 
the obvious to somebody else was not obvious to me because I'd been brought up with everything and I hadn't been forced to do anything or take charge or anything. So I was a dumbo, a real dumbo, a sitting duck for anything that wanted to do whatever it felt like. And the weirder the better because that made sure nobody would believe me. And they'd think, oh, she's a crazy nun. And I think a lot of people did think that. And yet a lot of people were very kind and very generous and helpful. Forty years ago, I stepped on a nail and had to have anti-tetanus shots. And I was already taking... Uh, a muscle relaxant. And it all ended up with me being a, a sort of form of an ND ear. I woke up one morning in a, diff a different world and it has never changed back. Now I think that really pushed things along for 40 years. But uh, the only way I could get rid of it seemed to be a different world at night up in the sky. The only way I could get away from that, well, the daytime too, was to move to the country. And out in the country it was no longer in the sky, it was sideways at the neighbors. So that's what happened when I moved to the country. That's why I went. I, I could stand it better. At night there was no getting away from it. And in the, in the daytime, if I went to Victoria Avenue Church and played the piano for three or four hours, which they let me do three or four times, because I used to go there as a kid, for two or three hours, everything would be fine. I think it was the using of the hands. Everything would be fine, and then little by little it would seep in. I'd hear a somebody half a mile away bark, or a dog bark or something and at night it would get worse it was like another world closing in unless I played the piano and I was in an apartment without a piano I didn't get one till I moved back to the country but that more or less saved my sanity in the city you see, I was strongly left-handed, and that's what caused the trouble in the first place. Not normal left-handed. My left hand had taken over. Uh, let's see. Very right-handed. I won't use the left anymore as I used to. And yet now and then I have to. For instance, to turn over in bed, if I'm going to use the railing, which is the way I do it, I have to use both hands separately but I don't use my coffee cup in the left hand anymore I was doing that and uh, well I haven't tried it anymore I simply told it it was not going that way anymore and that was that now we go right handed on the coffee coffee cup oh everything I've worked so hard for in the past say 10 years would be lost I think it simply hinges on which way I want to go. Well, I know which way I want to go. And I suppose as a kid I didn't know. Whichever side I lie on in bed at night makes a difference. I just knew you'd ask and I don't know whether to tell you or not. It makes a big difference in how the radio works. Whether I get certain stations or whether I can easily make it move or it's difficult. Sometimes I can't get the CBC when somebody's got the TV on somewhere or maybe it's just me, I'm not sure. December 25, 2006, Monday. On Number 10B, side 1, in the very beginning, there are some interesting words that come through the music. I don't know whether this is interference or more of these odd words. They're almost indecipherable. 
there are two noises like sneezes, which I don't believe they are. And then there are the odd words, Eber, Aaron. Then the one word, Robert. Immediately before this, there is the vague sound of what might be a series of words coming upward through something, which sounds vaguely like you will live on if you can hear it. These words change to a sort of a sideways uh, sound, much smaller, and with a very faint, sharp, tinkling noise for each word. And then it became simply a series of fast, very fine, small, tinkling noises. These last sounds were rapid, they could be missed easily. I heard them the night of January the 2nd, uh, 2007, about 11.15 p.m. I believe these are some of the voices I hear, only not so close in when using my hands in various ways, even just normal movement around the room. There is more of this word usage, but I can't hear it clearly enough. Which They don't want to. Uh, when they, you say radio, all they know is today's music loud as possible. This, my roommate, is that way. I mean, I listen to a radio for the spoken word as well as music, and very little music because they're not playing classical music. Not that I can get that is. Now and then I hear some decent stuff. I they hear the Beatles or some of the oldies. Even The Rock was playing uh, Painted Black. That was a real shock. They've gone way back to get that one. You don't hear many of the oldies anymore. A lot of those cassettes I gave you are recordings of the oldies that I like. But there is one, a spot where I started listening every night. And I began to get extra words. To, um, in between a couple of pieces, there would be sufficient time for a word or two to come out. It was a, a male voice speaking this word. Um, it's towards the beginning, I think, of the oldies tapes. And I even started copying down on a specific tape what I was hearing, where and when and why. Well, I don't know why. It was interference, is all I can say. Not any particular voice, just a voice that was available somewhere. It, it was not a radio station. Possibly it was taken from radio stations, but it was not an A station. These were words on the, what was already recorded. If I had it to do now, I might take an odd tape from the oldies recordings and listen, and eventually when I stopped, or even before I stopped, there would be a word inserted. One word, or two or three sometimes, by a voice that had nothing to do with the radio station. I'm pretty sure, because it, was, it wasn't coming on the radio, it was coming on the already recorded cassette, and you'll find them if you stick with it long enough, and you'll find where I recorded, I was beginning to record, beginning to note down where these extra words were inserted, that's all on a cassette somewhere.
just anywhere at all, any time, any part of the world. They were all English, though. I'm trying to think of one. There was one, one that came out in one version, and then next time I listened, it was a little different. Something to do with Arizona or the southern U.S. It was a word that could be changed every time you heard it, and it was changed about three times. That would be my head, I presume, because I don't know why else it would be there. Apparently this is the night of the full moon, and sometime during the night and on towards morning there will be a lunar eclipse that is supposed to be quite spectacular. Tuesday, August 28, 2007. If there's anything I need, do not press the poor thing down. These words were written at the bottom of the second page, the inner page of a letter. I, it looked like my writing, I couldn't be sure though. To whom or about whom, I don't know anything. Um, in a vision I had around 1.32 o'clock maybe when resting. The writing was in a fairly thick marker but was quite clear and large and angled up on the right, as a r normal right-hander writes. The marker was black, and the writing was at the bottom of the folded second page. On the folded third page was about three-quarters of the page full of letter, but there was no signature. The second page was also filled with letter. The ordinary letter was written in, in blue pen and ink. Only this statement was written large and black with a marker. And written, not printed. I, I couldn't get the capital, but the rest was written. Really, I did not see the whole thing clearly. I heard it as I was reading just the last little bit. In trying to put my wash out during the morning, I had had to put on every brake I could in order to keep my right side down so I could do anything. This I have to go through every now and then, and we did have a full moon last night and an eclipse. So I certainly spent the morning pressing this poor thing down. <laughs> One wonders what it's all about. The braking system consisted of a rubber band on the right wrist left bra strap extra tight and getting down on the right toe. Now I started last night putting pins in my hair again and eventually this morning I had to pull it back in a ponytail also. This is the first time I've used pins in several months. The understanding of what happened woke me immediately, and I was not dead asleep. To clear up the confusion, we are dealing here with one sheet of paper, folded one. And we were looking at the inner fold, which consisted of page two and page three. I was not up until 5 to 12 for the first time in months, and I fed the cats and 
myself and did some washing. So this little vision may have happened a quarter to three or three o'clock. It was also necessary this morning to put on my heavy leather white right shoe tied tightly and loosen the left shoe. Now the left shoe was not tight. I figured it was okay, but I had to loosen it and things were much better thereafter. Apparently the left foot still turns in which it did ferociously way back in the beginning, or it was that way erroneously. Anyway, I can breathe better. I could do my work afterwards, so it's usually a necessary item. The left shoe is a tied, heavy-soled canvas shoe, also white and very comfortable. The wording of the statement is of interest because the term poor thing I gave to a horse in a poem which started out some 50 horses in a race for not a one of them could face the fact that youth had somehow flown and lately most of them had shown a tendency to slumber. Poor thing was in the back, but the poor thing got some help and won the race. A goat was sitting on its perch on some a wood pile. Along came the horse. The poor thing happened to be going by when the goat was angry because the horses had rattled the pile of lumber. So the poor thing got some help from the rear and won the race. Thursday, August the 30th, 2007. Friday, August 31st, 2007. Nothing recorded. Possibly an over-recorded cassette. I cannot tell. I only know it appears to be empty on both sides. So I'm using it because these things are darn hard to come by. I've decided to put down a few things here. Do you remember when your dad and I were about separate that I had a place for you to go in Chatham while I worked and I would I told you about how you'd spend the day there and then you'd have your dinner then you'd have a nap and then you'd get up and play and then you'd look up the street and see me coming from work and then we'd hop on the bus and go home a lot of people think I just went away and left you with Aunt Frances and Uncle Carmen but as far as I'm concerned they stole you because they did not get in touch with me at all, ever. Secondly, I'm putting down an incident here that nobody almost knows about. Done by your father at Wabash. And I took his word for it that it was an accident. But I've come to the conclusion it was no accident that possibly it was the result of this thing I've been fighting against all my life that upsets everything and in, in this place is interfering in everything I try to do, everything I have to do, and everything seemingly that the world is doing. Now you can think what you want to about that, but when I tell you what happened at Wabash, you may change your mind, I don't know. I don't know whether to blame your dad very much or not, except that he was the instrument used to perpetuate this business. Uh, one day I put you in your little metal buggy that was very noisy to start with, 
and took you for a walk along the road down towards Carnes. Now that was noisy on that road. And your dad back at the house must have heard us. He must have known where we were. I got down to in front of Carnes and heard what I thought was a bird zooming over my head. Then I realized, no, it was a bullet. So I turned around and there was your dad back at the back door, our back door with the rifle in his hand. He had just fired a shot. Well, I went back immediately and he said, he didn't say he was sorry, he didn't laugh or anything. There was no response other than, oh, I was shooting sparrows. He didn't look sorry, he didn't look anything except that whoops he failed in what he was trying to do this is what makes me think partly that he knew what he was doing and had no business doing it but as i say he might have been under the influence of this other thing that has done nothing but trounce me belittle me etc all my life it was never discussed i said I said, sort of laughingly, you don't need to shoot, I'll leave. But I went back in the house, did not go for more walk that day. Now you can look at this as though it was all his doing, or it was he was under the influence of this other thing that never left me alone. If you knew all the stuff I have to put up with these days, you would understand a little better, maybe. The main thing I have to put up with is that the minute I get something done, the next day I go near it and it's all a mess again. It's as if something has deliberately upset all my work overnight. And I'm beginning to think it has to do with two different worlds or something, that a, a person can be possibly two different people living in two different worlds and so of course your everything you do is going to be wrong for a lot of the time or upset and this is why people used to think, think I was strange and a little odd well I didn't to me the world was going along as it should except everything was jumping on me I was to blame for everything There were a couple of other incidents that your father was really mean. It happened back when the Boyle girls were having an engagement party. This is for two or three of them getting married at once. Be Bessie and Edna and so on. And uh, I was very interested in going to see their place. And your dad and I got all dressed up. I was seven months pregnant, and the minute he turned off the ignition switch, he said, okay, you're on your own. I was horrified. I burst into tears, and I never cried. I wasn't a crier, so there was nothing I could do about it. And he snored and put the car on again, and we went home. And your dad never wanted to be seen with me when I was pregnant. But I realize now that what he said came out exactly when he touched the ignition to turn it off. In other words, when he used his right hand. And I now realize that a lot of the stupid things I heard, mean things I heard him say, seemed to be coming from his right side. And he apparently had no, no left. That was the meanest thing your father could have done. I, I was really hurt. There I was really looking forward to this. The world was his. He was damn well free of me for one evening. He was going to stay free of me. And that was it. You see, I had to fight this in him all the time. He was never wanting to be with me. They thought he was Mr. Perfect. And who was I to leave such a perfect blue as that? Well, he wasn't perfect. Well, I met Bird out of Wabash, but I was, what, 20, 20, 
close to 21. Right. And um, the one thing I cannot explain, except it was something wrong with birth, they might say today that he was autistic. He would never look me in the face. No eye contact for four and a half years. I've heard of one other person like that. Not no eye contact after we were married. But I could have done a lot better. I must admit that now. But to have no eye contact for four and a half years with the person you were living with was a bit odd. But to tell the truth, it didn't sink in as it should have. It would now. I'd, I'd probably <laughs> whack him on the shoulder and say, look at me. That's what happened anyway, and we split up. And because I left, then I couldn't have any of course. And everybody thought the worst of me. Oh, I was the bad one, always. The Blakeleys were pure as snow. I don't know why I was never allowed anybody that I was equipped to live with, that I would have enjoyed living with. It just seemed that everybody else did what they wanted to, but I never could. And I blamed people. Now I know it's not people. Now I know it goes far beyond that. So the basic thing wrong with my life was that I insisted on living alone.